Hello everyone and I hope you're all doing extremely well. So today for something a little bit different. Now you already know about my two main interests or hobbies as you might call them. The first and foremost being military aviation and you probably worked that out by now because of the 2000 videos and whatnot and all the DCS and stuff but my second uh, interest is car mechanics and I'd love to bring you some of that one day but we're going to have to wait until I get my own place in the future and I've just developed a third interest which is naval military history or naval military and this has only been an interest in the last maybe three months or so but the more I read into it the more I get into it I'm getting really enthused about it and I really want to I don't know, bring you guys with me is what I like to do just you know share it out with other people share with the enthusiasm it started uh, like I said about three months ago I've been doing tutorials on DCS world and I've run out of tutorials to do on the airplanes and done them all basically so I started doing the ships and if you go back three months and look at the videos that I did three months ago on the uh, Ticonderoga class light cruiser and the Russian uh, Moskva cruiser I had absolutely no idea what I was talking about at all. I was reading out Wikipedia and hoping for the best. Since then I've done as much learning as I can and book reading and I'm really getting into naval military and especially naval military history. So that's the question why I'm finding naval military history, history so fascinating, even sometimes more fascinating than aviation military is I think it's got everything that aviation military has got. It's got all the awesome technical stuff, uh, all the, the radars, the sensors, the sonars and so on. But it's got something additional to aviation and uh, it's got what I'd call the human factor. So if we think about an aircraft, a modern military aircraft, an EF-2000, an F-15, whatever, it's got a pilot, maybe two pilots in it, extremely highly trained, extremely reliable, for instance, it's extremely unlikely that those pilots would ever mutiny on their aircraft. Those are the kind of things you don't have to worry about um, on, on fighter jet aircraft that we have in DCS and stuff like that. But with the ships, there is the real addition of the human factor. So if we look at a, you know, a capital ship, a battle cruiser or a battleship, a dreadnought, you can have over 2,000 men aboard a World War II battleship about 30 maybe 40 percent of those will be officers the remainder will be ratings often a lot of those ratings uh, this will be their first time out to sea so they're not, these are not massively experienced highly trained pilots there are people sometimes in a big fight against Scharnhorst or whatever and a lot of these guys have never even been to sea before and so much of the performance of the vehicle, of the uh, of the dreadnought, of the ship, of the battle cruiser, depends on the human factor, the morale of the crew. Have the officers been treating the ratings well? How is the relationship between the captain and the officers? How is the relationship between the higher officers and the lower officers, and the lower officers and the ratings? And is the food good on the ship? Is everyone getting proper sleep and stuff like that? And this translates directly to how well the ship can fire, how the rate of the main guns fire, how the navigation is done, and so on. So you've got this real intrinsic human factor that I found in, when I've started to read naval books that just isn't there in aircraft or certainly not as much in aircraft. When a World War II uh, warship was going to go into action, one of the things on the checklist to do was not checking the missiles, checking the gun safety, it's making sure that the crew have enough cigarettes to last the fight, to keep their morale up high enough, making sure they had enough tea uh, to keep their morale up. It's just uh, so different in that respect. It's something I'm really interested in, as well as the, you know, the technical factors and the technology. And it's something I haven't come across so far. So today, um, to get into it, and we'll see if you guys are into it or you're not, uh, we'll start on an easy one. Uh, the U-Boat Peril, A Fight for Survival by Bob Winnie. So what I plan to do, it's a bit strange I know, but I plan to do, just talk about the book a little bit to try and get you guys into it. A mini book review for a few minutes. And then I'd like, if I may, to read you guys a chapter, my favourite chapter from the book, to try and share why I'm finding it, well, just so cool. So first of all, a look at the book. 
Okay, so The U-Boat Peril, first published 1986. The author is Bob Winnie. Now, I was expecting, I was reading a series of documentary-style books uh, before I came on to this one, and I was expecting a kind of third-person narrator-led a documentary about the U-boat peril, well, peril, possibly from the uh, position of U-boats, but I was completely wrong. What it is, it's actually from, written from the first person, from Bob, Win Bob Winnie, who was a lieutenant commander and a ship captain himself, and it was almost like an autobiography of his World War II years and what he got up to in the war. In terms of anti-submarine, so in terms of sailing destroyers, to destroy World War II Nazi submarines. And because it is from that first person perspective with a real human factor in there, talking about personalities of different admirals and captains and commanders, I found it I find these are the best types of books, even when you're looking for a documentary trying to learn because of that extra factor, personal factor that it has. So we'll blast through the contents. So we start with chapter one here, not by the book alone, and this jumps in at the deep end. It fasts forward, if you like, to 1943 or 14, I think it's 1944, and it's straight into an anti-submarine hunt with his destroyer, and we have a cool chase, uh, as, we'll look about, as we'll look at in the chapter that I'll read to you, where we hunt down and sink the submarine with the technology at the time. And one thing that comes out in this chapter here is how often the author and probably other ship captains went against the book, uh, ignored orders and went rogue. In this case, the guy ignored his orders and went after the U-boat, but because he sunk the U-boat, it all came good in the end. Chapter two, into the gun room. So this is getting back to reality. So we reset the story now. This is uh, for following Winnie from 13 years old into Navy. So at 13, he joined the relevant Navy officer training. So uh, an officer's school, if you like, at 13. It's crazy to think about it. And we have a brief history of his education in the Navy up until he was uh, sailing on active ships. So this was based in the late 20s and in the 30s. And the one thing that really comes through is the amazing strictness, the high discipline required. You couldn't really get away with anything. I'm not sure if the Navy is like that anymore, but the discipline was, uh, it was really hard back then. Next is Rodney. Rodney is what we call a pocket battleship. It's a battleship uh, that was built to satisfy certain legislation at the time. It was a bit odd. It was like a, a battleship cut, cut in half. Uh, if you go and research it, you'll see what I mean. And this was the guy's first military ship that he sailed on. He was a subordinate to the Rodney's then captain. And what he really looks at is the outbreak of a mutiny. So these are the big British mutinies in the 1930s in Invergordon in Scotland that I had absolutely no idea that even existed. And this kind of gets onto the point I was talking about earlier when you're not just dealing with technology, you're really dealing, as well as trying to fight the bad guy, you're also trying to fight your own crew. And this mutiny breaks out and several battleships and other ships, other classes, are completely shut down by a massive mutiny that happened. It was hushed up at the time, obviously, but history has brought it out. And it's just amazing to see how, um, how uh, a, a navy can be brought to its knees by uh, its crew, its ratings, uh, mutiny. And it shows why, and this is uh, kept on throughout the book, how you have to keep your crew happy, especially the ratings, how you have to keep them happy. And if you want the ship to operate, because you need those 2,000 sailors all to be doing their job perfectly for the ship to operate. Next, Chapter 4, Watchkeeper. This is a mixed chapter where our man becomes officer of the watch on the ship that he's serving on. He also has training in shore. And this is where he discovers his, if you like, his love of anti-submarine warfare. He has uh, anti-submarine warfare training on techniques and technology. And he describes the current system known as ASDIC. Uh, today, this will be known as sonar. So the way this would work at the time is a dome would drop out from the middle bottom of the ship and it would be able to turn around in azimuth that would send a cigar, large cigar shaped beam of controlled sound out. This, and this moves at the speed of sound in water. If it hit a submarine, uh, then it would bounce back and the ping would then be heard by a receiver, which would then be 
interpret it with a guy with some headphones on in what they call the ASDEC ASDEC cabinet, which is a small kind of half soundproofed room, usually at the back of the bridge. So there's no thanks fancy analog or digital screens or anything like that. This is so simple. The guy is literally listening with, listening with his headphones. And um, depending on what the sound of the ping sounds like, does it sound metallic? Then it's probably a U-boat. Does it sound thuddy? It's probably a whale. It would be up to the skill of the guy listening. He would get the azimuth by the direction of the dome instrument. He would get the range because he knows the speed of sound so, uh, in water. So uh, he can just measure that and he can get a direction uh, by using basic Doppler effect. And then because he was uh, placed close to the captain of the ship, uh, they could work together to hunt the ship down. This is basic destroyer, anti-submarine destroyer tactics or frigate tactics or cruiser tactics in World War II. The only problem, like with the radar, which had just been put on these ships in the last few years as well, is that it's easier than it sounds. Like with the radar, it's easily confused. Um, pings will come back from whales, from shoals of fish, from aerated water, and those pings would be dependent on the skill of the ad stick listener to determine what that object actually was. It would also require other things like the ship to be stable. If the ship was rolling side to side, the beam would no longer be aiming where they thought it was aiming. It's, ex it's something extremely complicated and needs a huge amount of skill because of the lack of technology at the time, as you can imagine. In fact, uh, something quite cool is you did actually get a kind of, uh, if you imagine a sonar display nowadays, in, in a nowadays destroyer, it would be a cool digital affair, the kind of like thing you'd see on a screen of a F-18 Hornet, you know, but back then there was no such thing as a screen. But what you did have was a roll of paper that span around on a roll, and the ASDIC pings that came back would make a mark on that spinning drum of paper. And you could actually track, I'll show it if I don't forget in the book, track of the distance of the object that the azimuth directed ASDIC was pointing at. So you could track if a U-boat was going away from you or towards you that way. Needless to say, it demanded a huge amount of collaboration, cooperation between the ASDIC operators, because there was a whole team of them, and the guys in control of the ship. Uh, next, chapter five, Voices in the Dark. This refers to an episode when our man was Lieutenant Commander Second in charge of uh, H.M. Duncan, which was a uh, anti-submarine destroyer, I believe, at the time. We must have been early 40s now. We were in the uh, sea north of Scotland, I think it was, and the lookouts were doing their job at the post at the rear or at the side, I think it was on the, the, the port side of the vessel. Um, he reported down the what we call a voice pipe, so right, we'd have radios nowadays or radio type communication to speak to different people on the ship. Back in these days, you had brass pipes. So you had a brass pipe that would go all the way to the back of the ship, a guy would speak into it, and all these pipes would come back onto the bridge. I mean, how cool is that, right? That's just amazing. Oh, it's just cool. And um, down the voice pipe, uh, voice pipe come from the port side was uh, from a lookout saying, I hear voices in the dark because a lot of these activities be going on the, in the dark. Um, most of the contact and the fighting was done at dark submarine and anti-submarine. And shortly after the report of Voices in the Dark, there was a big bang, and it turns out that a, uh, not a civilian ship, a merchant type ship, and it was either a tanker, may have even been a mine layer, slammed into the side of uh, the Duncan friendly fire, basically, and almost sunk it. Uh, these destroyers were not heavily armoured like battleships or heavy cruisers, and they were lucky to uh, keep the vessel. And um, the point of this chapter is to say how many of the well, on both sides really, but how many of the British fleet were sunk by not necessarily friendly fire, although there was that as well, but just crashing into each other due to the U-boat peril from the Nazi U-boats. Vessels were forced to travel in, pu travel in tightly packed in convoys and inevitably, especially bearing in mind we would be doing this in zero visibility with all lights out for all ships, they hit each other and loads were sunk this way. Next is chapter six, The Hunt for Bismarck. Now, although you guys watching are probably aviation enthusiasts, I have no doubt that almost all of you would have read one way or another about the hunt and the sinking 
of the Bismarck. So this book or this chapter talks about our man's role in that. He was first lieutenant either on the repaired Duncombe or the Cossack, I forget now, both of which would be destroyers, either fleet or converted. And um, he heard, hears through the wire that the Bismarck has been found as being hunted. When big battles happen like this, unlike, a, say, a dogfight in an aircraft, which would take seconds, these actions would take days. It's really fascinating to plot out the actions over days of hunting a Shan horse or a Bismarck or whatever. So in summary, the Bismarck was found by another fleet, so um, another vessel, and then our man here and his captain have to decide whether they continue their mission, which is to protect the convoy that they are protecting, or they feel that they can detach and hunt the Bismarck. These are destroyers at the end of the day. They are, their job was to go out and kill uh, capital ships like the Bismarck. It turned out that they went rogue, they ignored their order, orders at uh, possibility of court-martial offence, and they went and hunted the Bismarck, and we talk about how that happened. Now, as it turns out, we never get any shots on the Bismarck. I don't think we even get it in visual but we're just talking about our role in the affair and how we helped out. Next is West Africa. Our man gets sent to West Africa on the Cossack destroyer. A breeze over this one quickly, it's not that interesting. He then gets uh, forced to do a desk job in West Africa that he hates. Uh, it's too hot, uh, terrible food, and he ends up getting malaria and uh, sick and has to come back home. This takes two years, 1942, 1943, early, I think. And he's charged with uh, the big highlight of this chapter is obviously there were U-boats operating West African waters taking down merchant shipping and he was there to stop that obviously and he was just saying how all about how tied his hands were about how little resources Churchill would allow for this uh, because he needed them to protect the Atlantic and the Russian convoys and how vulnerable they were and how lucky they were that the Nazis uh, Hitler didn't put more U-boat resources into this area because he could have changed the course of the war if he did because there simply wasn't the British naval fighting ability down there. Next, command. Our man, still a lieutenant commander, gets his own ship, controls his own ship. So he heads back to England to find the ship, which is in pieces at the time, and they need to rebuild it for a conversion. In fact, I think we'll jump to that chapter. So if we can see this here, this is what he was given. It's a World War I Fleet destroyer. This means it's a relatively short range destroyer that is designated to defend a capital ship or aircraft carrier. We would defend that ship by intercepting a hostile that's coming to attack it. it would, therefore, it was designed to go extremely fast, as quickly as possible, to maneuver into position to fire its primary offense, which was torpedoes to attack the hostile capital ship. You know, this is the thinking at the time. It was thinking that dreadnoughts would be fighting dreadnoughts uh, mainly, which did happen a little bit in World War II, but obviously 90% of it wasn't. And that was the idea of the fleet destroyer, as well as protection from anti-submarine as well. You can see we have depth charges at the back here. Now, this was converted in 1943, so it's 20 something years old at the time, to LRE, long range, escort mainly in terms of anti-submarine so it was designed now to project merchant shipping not from battleships but what was becoming the main threat which was of course the uh, the the lone wolf submarines and then the wolf packs so what we have is a reduction in guns uh, we have the 4.7 inch pretty small but that you know it's a world war one uh, destroyer at the end of the day so only one turret, turret remaining at the front one turret out remaining at the back down from the four turrets the torpedoes wherever they are there um, are completely gone now with no torpedo ability at all so we're not going to be able to do any damage to a large ship what we do have is increased double rack and larger racks of depth charges 300 pound depth charges and a new weapon for world war ii for taking down submarines uh, uh, almost intelligent weapon called a hedgehog which i think we hear about a little bit later on in terms of the structure the bridge structure has changed uh, very importantly the engines have been downrated we have only two boilers instead of three so we used to have so the whole idea of destroyer back when was that it would go 34 knots which for world war one was bloody fast a huge amount of power to a 27,000 shaft horsepower and a very lightweight frame so you could dash into position and get around the back of the capital ship and or the flank of it and uh, send out torpedoes so in this case we got rid of one of the boilers we're down to 18,000 horsepower 27 knots but we've added an extra uh, bunker 
um, for the, the oil that we fuel basically. So we can go much further because long range support is what it's all about now. As well as that, several small changes, um, so extra, I think, anti air, well, they, they change around the, the guns in terms of anti aircraft, but those are the main changes. So this uh, is what he got, and a few months later, six months later, this was what it was converted to. So this was what would have been known as the V or W class of World War One destroyer, and this was the LRE WV conversion. Okay, let's head back. So next is nine contact. This is where we get into some proper anti submarine warfare for the first time in his command. He's operating, I think, between Derry, so Northern Ireland, and Gibraltar at the time. And we'll, go, we'll read that chapter out. Number 10, Gibraltar and back. So he is operating as the uh, lieutenant commander and in charge of this ship. Uh, should have, I forgot to say, it's called the Wanderer, HM Wanderer, the, the LRE destroyer, operating between Derry, Gibraltar and Malta uh, for several years, 19, well, 1940, no, just 1943, I think, and he is escorting long-range merchant shipping supplies to Malta. And one highlight of this is when he was detached uh, from the convoy to go into one of the main rivers in Portugal, which was essentially, you know, on the way. Uh, he travelled several hundred miles up this river, which goes right through Portugal, to meet a 007 type spy, which is quite interesting. Next, 11, Northern Waters. So he's in HM Wanderer, still in command, but gets transferred to the Northern Waters. So we're talking about Northern Seas, uh, Iceland, Eastern Greenland, and uh, Northern Scandinavia. And they see some action there. They're, they're obviously, they're um, escorting the Russian convoys now, as we'll look at in a bit. And they do see action with anti-submarine warfare, but it's mainly about how dangerous and difficult it was to operate especially smaller ships like destroyers in the northern waters in really any time of the year it was a constant battle to keep the uh, to keep the ship afloat at one point we get into force 12 gales which is well, higher than it's ever been seen before and the ship almost sinks and um, a lot of ships are sinking around him but they managed to save the ship but it never really recovers the ship never really recovers from the battering next chapter 12 the sea is here south again so detached again to south southern seas for the same type of convoy duties and we get more action and another sunken sub that we'll have a look at next is invasion so this is the preparations for d-day southern england northern france and we're doing uh, in we're still in the old 25 year old HM Wanderer destroyer at the moment and at this point we are defending English southern waters from what we call E echo boats these are boats that come in at pitch black at night lay mines in the English shipping channel south of England and then basically run away they're not fighting boats they're purely to zoom in lay mines and run away and we are in the Wanderer at that point hunting these boats with various techniques radar and sonar and uh, and shooting them and it shows how uh, various tactics are developed at the time as well as defending from Luftwaffe aircraft that are hunting us with guided bombs who knew that gbus were a thing in world war ii i certainly didn't but they were radio controlled bombs and finally on d-day obviously our uh, agent wanderers escapades uh, we are protecting one of the american beaches i forget which um, we're protecting a division that's been transported in um, converted merchant shipping to D-Day, and um, D-Day isn't just a day, it's, you know, the, the event of landing took, you know, many days backwards and forwards, constantly across the channel, and we sunk a U-boat at the time. Then, the ship is retired, because it's just too tight, it's got too many leaks, and it's con considered a write-off, not repairable, paid off, and the crew paid off. So next, I think we'll have a quick, uh, quick look at the map. So this is a map, and a brief summary of the escapades of this particular captain in his various charges. Uh, so we'll try and go blast through them quickly in uh, time and order. So I think this is going to be the first one here. This is, uh, I didn't mention this, this is a Duchess uh, was around. This was a fellow escort destroyer. So it, we had a flotilla of several destroyers here. Our man was uh, number one to the captain of the destroyer flotilla uh, senior officer. And the way that these uh, escort flotillas would work. They would be there to protect a capital ship, whatever that was, heavy cruiser, uh, battleship, aircraft carrier, and they would they would sail in formation like the Grim Reapers do, which is, sounds weird, I know, but that's just how they had to do it, in front of um, the uh, the protected ship in a fan formation, and this is to ensure that no U-boats 
uh, could uh, get to the battleship. The only way a U-boat can get to the battleship because of its speed limitations is to find out where it's going, sail in front of it, stop, uh, submerge, and then wait for the ship to pass because uh, battleships are obviously much faster than a U-boat. So this fan formation in front with our sonar and our various other senses would have, be like a dragnet that we're dragging to make sure that no U-boat can do its job. Now the unfortunate thing is of doing this, usually in a picture of black when, uh, at night when a U-boat would prefer to attack, there were casualties and this time they were protecting a heavy cruiser. They have to turn everything in perfectly formation with all lights out in pitch black, no forms and with radio silence. So you can imagine how, I don't know how they did it. It's completely impossible. Um, but they did have a collision where the capital ship did end up ramming the Duchess destroy it, sinking it immediately and killing almost everyone on board. Extremely dangerous uh, job to do at the time. Like I said, even just, even just getting a battleship from one point to another you could lose hundreds of men on the way, even if there's no enemy. Uh, next would be in the 40s in Duncan. We talked about the Duncan being rammed there by an oil tanker. Uh, they had some awesome action here. Uh, this was actually on the coast, I believe, but they found a convoy, a troop convoy, with some limited attack ships in the middle of the night. Uh, through This is all through Ultra going on in Bletchley um, at the time that told us, uh, told the admiralty of the location of this convoy and so they snuck in pretending to be a german ships in the middle of the night like i said most action done in the middle of the night and they got point blank and sail broadside point blank to this merchant shipping merchant shipping just didn't notice uh, that these um these two destroyers we had two two british destroyers our man and another and once we were you know 100 meters away broadside opened up with guns and machine guns and 20 mil and just obliterated the entire convoy, um, which was an interesting chapter. Then they turned around and steamed as fast as they could, 27 knots, back to England, being chased by the Luftwaffe all the way, but they managed to dodge all the bombs and the Stukas and whatnot. Uh, it's pretty cool. Next would have been our Western African operations here. So we're based down here in Freetown, and we're doing patrols by ship and by air at the time. We're trying to find out information about where the U-boats, uh, hostile U-boats, are refueling to down here, because obviously this is so far away from Germany. Germany is sending their Milchkaus, as they were called, uh, the oilers in to uh, recharge the fuel boats but we had to find those areas to stop the fuel boats operating it was the best way of taking new boats down including these islands here which are called uh, the cape Ver verde islands um uh, which is an interesting chapter then we're back up uh, then we're operating in our own ship we've got captain of the wanderer and we're operating from Derry to malta uh, sorry to gibraltar to Malta, protecting the various convoys back and forwards. We get this, we sink this guy, which is the one chapter we're going to read. U523 sunk on the August 1943. Next, they go to the Northern Waters, and the whole idea of the Northern Campaign was to run from uh, Northern Britain and or Iceland, if I can find it there, all the way up to here. And the idea is we'll be supplying Stalin in 42 and 43 because he's taking the brunt of the Nazi attack at that point. You know, almost all the guys being killed relatively are Russians. And um, we have decided it's in our interest in the alliance in the United States, British, Soviet, uh, sorry, the Russian alliance that we would help them out. And so we were supporting it all. Couldn't have done it without the support of the Allies sending shipping of uh, vehicles, petrol, um, everything you need, food, everything you need for fighting to here. So this is what kept the Russian campaign going. And again, if it had collapsed, then the, you know, the war would probably wouldn't have been won. There were two routes, depending if it's summer or winter. This would be the winter route up here. And you can see how close you get to the top of the Scandinavian countries here. This was the dangerous route in winter because you, uh, what we found, uh, another book I'm reading at the moment, is that the Germans would have um, capital ships and flotillas based in these fjords here that would come out, pop out and attack um, um, surface on surface attack vessels here, uh, attack fights here. So the reason they had to go for this route in the winter is that the ice sheet here of the Northern Pole would come all the way down here and so you couldn't sail any higher than that. In summer you had a safer route, I'm just trying to find it up here, around here, around, all the way atop here above Bear Island, which is a marker, all the way back around here so you could bypass the threat more or less and that was about 400 miles as I remember in the book that I'm reading at the moment, much easier to avoid 
uh, 400 miles than 50 miles. And our man at the time would be uh, escorting ships. He had a limited range, so there's only so far he could go. And then he would have to turn back and the boats would be on their own. He would have convoys going uh, uh, forwards and backwards through those two years and even further on as well. And like I said, yeah, I'm reading another book at that uh, at the moment. Here is um, the twist. It wasn't our man. It was another boat, just uh, worth mentioning, but a 12-hour U-boat hunt with three destroyers. Uh, it's interesting here. And finally, we have a last charge, which is prior to uh, the D-Day landings. We have an E-boat set on fire down here. What have we got here? Convoy escorts. Uh, so escorting the uh, invasions from June to September. So, like I said, three months. Um, the, the, the you know landing landings had to be lasted and had to be escorted and whatnot. And we sunk a U-boat here in the well, it's not the channel. It's the you know, Southern English Sea, whatever it's called. I'm not sure uh, that. I would like to read you a chapter now of the destruction of U-523 and see what you think, and then we'll wrap up. Chapter 9, Contact. Wanderer, and I'll comment on this chapter as we go through it, just to, I don't know, educate points, I suppose. Wanderer, the ship they were in, had done a couple of UK to Halifax convoys with Bravo 1 Escort Group, and we had our share of alarms, but no real excitement. Now the convoy had just arrived at Halifax, the ship was in a position ahead of the merchant ships and we got a firm ASDIC contact, so it was like a sonar ping basically. The Echo came back with a resounding wallop. The Admiralty Daily U-Boat Disposition Signal, that is, this essentially comes from Ultra, uh, I believe at Bletchley Park, through the Admiralty to the actual ships at sea to tell them the decoded messages of U-boats and where U-boats are to be expected. Probably other sources as well. Signal had put nothing in the area, so they expected no U-boats in the area. However, rather than wait, I went to action stations. This was quite a big thing to, we were talking about earlier, about the mentality of your crew. A captain that would put action stations on a lot, i.e. he was a bit jumpy, would piss off his crew, it would lower the morale of their crew, and so when it comes to real fighting, uh, their performance would be less. It's something a captain would have to balance all the time, this kind of thing. Massive decisions that had to be made all the time. And one slip, something that comes in the parent in the book, and you lose everything, court-martialed. Uh, it must be the worst job in the world. What do you think of it? I said to Kid. Kid is his number one. Seems much too big, too wide for a target for a submarine. It's fish, said the officer of the watch. I can see them. Ask the senior officer for permission to test smoke-making apparatus, I said to the omen of signals. So he's asking here the senior officer of the destroyer flotilla, flotilla, if we're allowed to test using our smoke. We had smoke protection at the time from U-boats. After approval of this request and after laying a smoke screen to hide our activities, we attacked the fish shoal with a depth charge. The result was an area of the sea around the ship covered in dead and stunned cod. A boat was lowered. The scrambling net contraptions intended to allow survivors into the water to clamber up the side of the ship were lowered. The, med the men came in with improvised nets, buckets and baskets. They slid down the ropes to the water. Anything went to recover the fish. The consequence of some 10 minutes of uncontrolled hilarious activity was a pile of fish six feet deep high on the upper deck. The result was enough fish for our own ship, all the other ships in the escort, and even for the local hospital. And then this goes back to keeping your crew happy, even if you've got, if you've got to use a depth charge and break the rules. For the next trip, the escort group was transferred to do a UK to Gibraltar convoy. Better weather, not so cold. The prospect of getting ashore somewhere where there was some chance of shopping, this had some appeal. Bananas for some, sherry for others, beer and girls for the asking. Well, no, but very nearly, thought some of the young men. The convoy totaled about 40 merchant ships. One calm, starlit August evening with the ships southbound some nine miles off the coast of Spain was particularly pleasant and balmy. At about 11 p.m., so again, night time, I said to Frost, the officer on the watch, I'm turning in now. Stay ahead of station during the night and call me earlier than usual, an hour before first light. Any particular reason, sir? He queried. Do you expect anything to happen? No, I did not. The ship was ahead of the convoy to the port, playing left wing, so to speak. There were no U-boats, nor any other ships of possible threat according to the Admiral, Admiral's daily disposition signal. The instruction I had given in no way related to reason. 
I was asleep in my sea cabin when, about 4.30 a.m., Foster, the sub-lieutenant, now the officer, officer of the watch, called down the voice pipe conversationally. Captain, sir, I was going to call you soon anyway, but we've just got a very small echo ahead at 14,000 yards, so this will be from the Aztec. That's a hell of a distance for a small echo, I said. Sure it's not a ghost echo or something phony? Abel Seaman Herbert picked it up. The leading hand is in there now with him. Both of them say it's a true echo. This is the guys in the Aztec cabinet analysing the sound. 14,000 yards, 7 miles, a very small echo when there should be nothing there. 8 to 10,000 yards was the officially stated maximum range at which could, you could detect a surface U-boat with the Type 271 radar. Uh, my mistake, they're talking about the 271 radar. We have multiple radars on this, uh, uh, this ship as well. And our radars could pick up uh, air threats, surface threats, and surface U-boat threats until the schnorkel was invented. Uh, very puzzling. It could not be anything that the Admiralty knew about or we should have been told. Just possibly it could be some sort of enemy Q-boat. But if it were enemy, I wanted to capture it in, especially the signal books. This was incredibly important to capture the signal books, but without it, Bletchley Park Ultra and the equivalent stations couldn't do their work, or not as well. The idea of short action, sending a boarding party, and then taking a vessel in prize had a strong appeal. From the officer of the watch, 271, that's the type of radar they're using, reports echo firm, increasing in size, bearing, moving steadily right to left, sir. Officer of the watch, increased to 22 knots and pass the RT to the senior officer. I'm investigating, so radio transmission to the senior officer. I'm investigating radar echo. Give the range and the bearing. So we're passing the information to the leader of the flotilla. What do you think it is, sir? Press the alarm rattlers? No. We'll not be near it for a few minutes. Might still be something innocent. Send the bosun's mate around the mess decks and the bridge messenger to tell the officers we may be going to action shortly. Warn the engine room, and you may as well tell the galley to stew up lots of tea, just in case. So at this point he's not going through the official route of going to action stations per se, but he's sending unofficial channels, he's sending people around to warn the crew that there may be action stations soon and to prepare them with uh, food and tea and whatnot. Again, remember that action stations may have to be maintained for days on end, so this stuff has to be thought about in terms of a ship engagement. All was quite still, the shh, 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 as the ships cut through the slight swell, the hum of the boiler room fans and the muted talk of the men at B gun, which is the existing gun in front of the bridge. Then, as the men, surprised at the long warning, drift quietly to their action stations, came the Soto voice muttering available on the still night. What's the old man doing? There's no alarm yet, is there? So this is from the ratings. Bauer, the navigator and plotter, was on the plot now. The plot is something interesting. So uh, in your F-14B Tomcat, you've got the tactical awareness display, if you like, on the, F on the F-18C. You've got the SA page. This is where you plot out where all the various elements, friendly and foe, are in a top-down display. In this case, it was done by a physical board, you know, table, and a plotter, a very skilled navigator, plotting, you know, models, essentially, as far as I can see, on this table. So this is how they determined the situational awareness of these, uh, of these naval campaigns. And the inputs coming to the plotter, um, the skilled navigator, would be from radar, from ASDIC, from experience, from sightings, uh, and so on. And uh, even we had uh, uh, kind of a, uh, an old school type of data link in that the, uh, the plotters could communicate to each other from different ships to send information over, like you would a data link in a, in a modern ship or an aircraft. Bauer, the navigator, was on the plot now. He would not get it wrong. Targets, very important, the plotter's position. Targets moving right to left, coursed easily, speed 12 knots, he reported. It looked like a gun action to come. Press the alarm rattlers, I said. There followed the immediate shuffling feet and rattling of iron ladders as the remaining officers and men dashed in the dark to their action stations. No shouting, no needless noise. Then came the steady flow of reports to the action officer of the watch from the guns, the radars, the ASDICs, the plot, the depth charge crews to say that we were all closed up and cleared away. Guns and weapons were so powerful on these ships, even destroyers, that just the blast from the guns damaged their own ship. So everything had to be closed away. Um, 
to protect from that as well as uh, attack from the hostiles. All necessary voice pipe and telephone communications were tested. It was quick, calm, practiced routine. Within seconds, all was quiet and back again. And this goes back to something said in the book, how much time is spent by these ships, kind of, if you like, off-duty training. Huge amount of time to get a new crew, some of these guys see for the first time, more or less, uh, up to speed and working together. Within seconds, all was quiet again, back to the same sea and machinery noises and a very quite mumbling background talk from B-Gun's crew. From me, B-Gun, star shell, load star. So back in these days we didn't have night vision, we had to see the enemy, ideally, technically there were radar guided guns, uh, most of the big ships would have radar guided guns, but um, ideally you want to see the ship to see which way it was turning, see what it was doing, see if it was firing at you, see how high it was running in the water. You load something called star shell into your guns of various calibers and fire, and this would uh, illuminate like flare uh, the enemy. So star shell would be the first thing that you'll fire at a hostile to gain SA. The first lieutenant arrived on the bridge, fire star shell, sir, and find out what it's all about. No, I want to get right up to it undetected and to the officer of the watch, all guns load. For the first time in the procedure, anticlimax. The order rang out loud around the ship. All guns load, load, load. Bower from the plot. Target course 065 degrees, 12 knots. Good plot. We're into 6,000 yards now, sir. The temptation to open fire was there, all right, but with fire control equipment no longer fitted to the ship, we were unlikely to hit any target except at point blank range. So, unfortunately, to convert to the LRE version of this vessel, they had to get rid of the fire control. Um, all vessels in World War II, frigate or above, their main guns had various forms of control in an ordered um, pattern of priorities at the top. They could be radar controlled, completely automated by radar, and fired by radar, even in 1940s. I know it's crazy, but that's how it was. And you've got all the way down to kind of manual firing. You'll see on the big ships, five, six, seven different ways of firing the big guns. Don't think that you had some guy there with an eyepiece, you know, it was done automatically most of the time. But we had to lose our fire control for the conversion, so we no longer have accurate fire control. Then, supposing it were a U-boat, it would be alerted by the gun flashes and would dive at once, well out of ASDIC range. Uh, something else we've got to point out, ASDIC was very limited at the time, it could only really turn in azimuth, it couldn't turn in elevation up and down. If a U-boat were to dive deeply below our beam, our ASDIC beam, that's it, we could never pick it up until it came near the surface again. That's just the limitations of the system at the time. It might use the advance warning to fire a torpedo at us, and it would anyway get a start on us making an escape before we could pick up the ASDEC contact. So ASDEC contact. So we're currently guided, guided in with radar, and we'd switch to ASDEC when we got close enough and could hear it. Uh, something else interesting to point out here: the first torpedo they would probably fire at us would be what they call a NAT, German NAT torpedo. This is a guided torpedo guided by acoustics, it would home into the propeller of our destroyer and we have to do moves as such in terms of speed and defence that allow us to stay safe from a gnat. Radar, I'm guessing this is the 271. Range, 3,000 yards, target very firm, increasing in size. So all he would see is a very basic analogue screen with a ping. Uh, if you saw my video I did on the, uh, the earliest radar development in the UK, um, then you see the kind of thing that I mean. That would be the kind of radar display these guys would be seeing. It would take a lot of experience to read these radar displays. Despite the admiralty intelligence, this could still be a U-boat. The ship should slow to maintain ASDIC operation speed, so you couldn't go too fast for the uh, or for fear of upsetting the ASDIC, the sonar. 18 knots, I ordered. Cup of tea, sir, from Cartwright. Thanks. Frost, you and the lookouts keep your eyes skinned ahead. Radar, range 2,800 yards. Target's getting smaller. It's fading. It's gone. Last bearing. 215 degrees. Plot. It's presumably dived. Plot. Give me a course to steer till the Azdek picks it up. Azdeks. Bearing 205, range 2,400 yards. The sonar's now picked it up. Just in time. 2,400 yards at 18 knots. 10 yards a second. That would be four minutes or, where, or thereabouts before a firing of the depth charge pattern. To Frost, the officer on watch. I'll take her now. To the coxswain, steer 205. Steer 205, sir. 
he repeated back. Then standby depth charges set at 100 feet. That means the depth the fuses are set to of the depth charges, 300 pounds high explosive. The ping echo ever faster as the range decreased simply because uh, you know the speed of sound. The closer you get, the quicker the ping return is going to be. Building tension must be nearly there. Aztec range 200 yards. Then simultaneous echoes. Kid, stand by. Fire. And he pressed the firing buzzer. Seconds, then crash. The stern of the ship rose and shuddered with explosions. Plumes of water rose astern. And the interesting thing about firing uh, using depth charges and the reason why, why the Admiralty were phasing it out is because they are so powerful and had to be fired so close to the ship that you would inevitably damage your own ship. You put your own ship out of service completely sometimes. Uh, because you're using depth charges. Uh, so this is why the Hedgehog and the replacement of the Hedgehog, I can't remember what it was called now, was designed. So And the, and the depth charges usually used, and if you look on modern destroyers, the, the depth charge, the rocket flingers, can you know fling hundreds of metres away from the ship. Bugger! I did not lay off enough. Not a kill, I said. Plot, looked like a good attack from down here, but slightly behind him. He put on a last second burst of speed, a lot of interpretation. At a certain range you lose your Aztec ping and the rest is guesswork by the plotter and the captain with watches and stopwatches and stuff. Cool, huh? The explosions of the charges disturbed the water. This blanked temporarily the U-boat from detection, but the Aztecs got him again. So if the water was aerated, full of bubbles, that would look like a ping back from the Aztec. Great relief we were to have another chance. This time we would make a sedate, deliberate attack. We would go by the book, use the hedgehog mortar, and as instructed, approach slowly. The hedgehog was attached on the front and would fling intelligent mortars ahead that would A, not damage us, and would be small, multiple small depth charges, if you like, that would sink, uh, they would detect a U-boat, explode, and they would be separated in a, in a chain of eight different hedgehog mortars. And the idea was that they were sensitive enough, enough that when one exploded, they would all explode and you would get this multiple chain reaction explosions around the U-boat and take it out. Of course, it rarely worked. As instructed, approach slowly. You have to approach very slowly for a hedgehog attack. I think it's about eight knots. Aztec, echo regain, bearing 040, range 1,200 yards. Myself, attacking with hedgehog speed, eight knots. I think it's because you don't want to catch up your own hedgehogs, so you have to go slow. Then, turning to Cartwright, get me another cup of tea and my cigarettes. And to Frost, See, everyone knows what's happening, include the engine room. It would be normal to keep the entire crew up to date with exactly what's happening. I found this a bit strange. I would have thought you would have kept the information to the bridge, but no, you would tell everyone always what was going on, or a good captain would. Slowly and with great concentration, we approached the U-boat. The Aztec operation, operating conditions continue to be excellent, unlike, for instance, the North Sea with aerated water, fish and whatnot. And the operators themselves provided their steady flow of precise and accurate information of the plot Based on the Aztec information, have the U-boat's movements exactly taped? Aztec, range 500 yards. We're coming up to it. The firing range for the mortar was 250 yards, plus or minus a few yards, to allow for the movement of the target. The hedgehog's crew on the forecastle at the front of the ship, top of the ship, were all prepared. We should just about get the attack completed before the convoy caught up. Remember, we're ahead of and defending a convoy. Probably they had no idea what's going on. Go on, kid. F uh, go on, kid. Fire when you're ready. From kid, stand by. Fire. You press the fire buzzer and the 24 mortar bombs, 24, well, ripple fired, sailed, it sailed into the air. Even in the dark, the pattern they formed on hitting the water, which would be like a circular pattern, was visible. If one bomb hit the target, the lot would countermine. We waited. Nothing happened. Then one small, non-convincing pop. The whole pattern of bombs had certainly not gone off. But that was a good attack, sir, said Kidd, somewhat indignantly. It was first class. Tell the Asdic team. It's that goddamn bloody useless ammunition. The whole fucking lot... <laughs> the whole fucking lot we've just used is to be sent back to the armament supply officer for test and report, I said, temporarily livid with fury. Asdic, targets to world turn towards the convoy. The Asdic operators in the contact with the U-boat could hear the hydrophone effect, the heavy throbbing of the approaching merchant ship's propellers the far side of the target. Plot, we confirm the U-boat's heading to get under the convoy. Damn and blast. Anger gone now. This was going to be a nasty... This was going to be nasty in the dark. 
U-boats had done this before. It was a means of usually unsuccessful escape. The problem was how to keep the Aztec contact. For the operators, the distracting hydrophone effect, the distracting thump, 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 thump of the motion ship's propellers and the aerated water of the ship's wake would cause them, would mask and deaden, if not completely stop, cut off the Aztec beam. Aztecs, we're going in among the ships of the convoy now. Do your best to hold contact. If we have to cross the columns, I'll tell you before we come to a wake. There it was. And this shows the constant back and forth you need between the... Uh, the various officers and the various sensor teams in or around the bridge. There it was, the convoy of some four dozen black looking unlit ships in a zigzag course. Into it we went after the U-boat. Plot. Targets altering course westward. Sir, trying to get on the other side of some of the wakes. Asdix. We're crossing a wake now, I said. Asdix. Lost contact, then. Contact regained. And I altered course again to pursue. Aztecs were going to cross another wake. Once more, the ship had to cross a wake at right angles, more or less, through the advancing columns of the convoy. Aztec lost contact. No, contact regained. It was going to happen a third time when, from Frost, the officer on the watch, merchant ship to starboard, altering, altering course towards us in a zigzag. She's going to be pretty close. We were going to be hit. Full speed, an emergency order which meant that the engine was to produce the maximum shaft horsepower might damage the Aztec dome in its lowered position at the bottom of the ship. Port 20, ring on 25 knots. In fact, we always gave orders for the ship's speed in terms of revolutions, knowing exactly what revs to order for the required knots. The wheel host below then rang on, ting 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 ting, the revs to the engine room to be steadily winding the rev counter up. Then. When we were clear and able to get round the stern into the next column of merchant ships, starboard 20, 15 knots. Remember when the uh, U-boat is submerged at a very limited speed. It was no good. The proximity of the merchant ship and our burst of speed made it impossible for the operators. Aztec contact was lost. We had been outmaneuvered by the U-boat. The exacting caper, dodging about, chasing in the blackness through the columns of the dark merchant ships had taken only some 15 minutes. I was, though, as never before nor since, in a cold, damp sweat, shaking a little at the legs. Plot. Work out a search scheme, assuming the target will have gone back to its original course and underwater speed and will be making for Lorient. Give the officer of the watch the courses for our own speed of 15 knots. The first lieutenant arrived on the bridge. Would you like a rest, sir? Shall I take over for a bit? No. Let's have more tea and cigarettes. Tell the gun crews they can relax, stay at action stations, no watertight doors to be opened. Obviously it's something you do in all uh, warships, you'd have all of the watertight doors closed to stop the, you know, the cellular design of the ship uh, being uh, flooded. Make the first teams of the radar and Aztec operators come out for a few minutes for fresh air, whether they want to or not. The second teams can take over temporarily. The ship was completing one of the standard square searches of the area recommended for such occasions. No good after half an hour, and then the search was nearly over. What next? I went down to the plot. Remember that they've got to protect this fleet, and the fleet is obviously the convoy has now got away. What next? I went down to the plop to talk it over briefly with Bauer when the Aztec reported again. Contact right ahead, echo 165 degrees, range 2,300 yards, good echo. Yes, it was. The echo came back with a firm, convincing clink. It could only have been a U-boat. During the early minutes of the square search scheme, we, Kid, the gunner and Mr Ellis, a very experienced warrant officer, and I held a post-mortem upon the failure of the hedgehog ammunition. Was the gunner actually present at the mortar before and when it was fired? Yes, sir, with mild indignation. Certainly he was. Was he absolutely satisfied that all the bombs were fully armed and set to explode? Yes, he had personally supervised that this had been done. I, in turn, was satisfied that the last attack was entirely accurate and the bombs fell just as they should in a good pattern. So what? Well, plainly, all the bombs had come from a dud lot. Ammunition was always mysteriously divided into lots. There was another fresh lot immediately available, said Mr. Ellis. Right, we will do another attack using the mortar, this mortar weapon of such high repute. So they're going to try the hedgehog again. Here was a second chance. 
Attacking with hedgehog, speed 8 knots, I said. The ship's approach was slow, 2,000 yards, 1,500 yards, 1,000 yards, as the steady, clear reports of the target's bearing and range came from, uh, came from the Aztec cabinet. Plot, what's the target doing? Plot. Going slowly away, about two knots on a mean course of 065 degrees. Aztec, range 600 yards, poor echo, echo fading, echo lost. So it's dived and gone under the Aztec beam. Oh bloody hell, whatever now. Almost at once the Aztec cabinet reported, contact regained. Then there was a brief muttering audible in the intercom. In the intercom. Kids talking to the operators, kids talking to the plot. And thirdly, 30 seconds later, it's a non-sub. It's an SBT, and the U-boat's gone deep. This was a clever piece of tactics, knowing that by going deep, the Aztec beam would pass over its hull. The U-boat captain had gone down to perhaps 500 feet. At the same time, he had released a submarine bubble target, SBT, decoy, a canister, which would cause effervescence, effervescence in the water and give a false echo, and thus, he hoped, throw us off the metaphorical scent. It was not for long. His cunning was met by the quick, shrewd, analytical teamwork of Kidd and Cox, backed by Bauer from the plot. Contact regained, bearing 2, 4, 0 degrees, range 700 yards, reported the Aztec. An immediate attack with the U-boat so close would not be accurate. It was, quite suddenly, daylight, and a corvette sent back from the convoy escort arrived to see if help was needed. Corvette's a very small uh, naval vessel. She at once reported Aztec contact. Attack! I said. Wanderer would do the next one, but it was unfortunately the SBT which the Corvette attacked. So the Corvette went for the decoy. Plot, I said meanwhile. Work on the last definitely known position of the target and give me the dope to get the ship's 2,000 yards astern of target on its mean course. And then we'll come in at 80 knots and hope to attack from the astern. The depth charge crews are to fire a pattern of 10 depth charges, then reload at top speed and fire another pattern of 10 with both patterns at the deepest setting. So a complete change of tactics with a decoy. We hope now we're regaining, so we've lost sonar contact with the submarine. So we're using our intelligence now. We're asking the plot to have his best guess where the submarine should be at this point and to position us and the Corvette a theoretical 2,000 yards back from it so we can run right up its stern and this time we're not going to use the hedgehog we're going to use uh, two salvos of depth charges which is pretty much unheard of at the time uh, for a destroyer uh, to well atomize it this was unorthodox i'd heard the commander johnny walker the great anti u boat ace had done something similar like this but at a low speed and with several of the ships in his group taking part at a time from kid do you think it will work sir if it doesn't we'll do it again the U-boat is deep, and you'll be out of contact for the last 50 or 60 seconds. So you'll have to work with Bauer to estimate the time of firing. You can give your hedgehog too. You can fire your hedgehog too. That's not allowed at speed, sir. The thing is no bloody good when we do obey the rules. It might work if we don't. The unsuccessful attempts to attack so far were not hardening, but the Aztec conditions were so good, that, and the U-boat so plainly on the defensive, that we seemed bound to win. From the plot, ships in position now, range 2,000 yards and the target bearing 065 degrees. That's the approximate course the U-boat's been trying to make good since we first picked him up. Attacking at 18 knots, I said. Then the ranges started to come down rapidly. 18 knots was 10 yards a second, 1,500 yards, 1,000 yards, 600 yards. And then from the Aztec, target fading, contact lost. So we did have Aztec contact, but as we got closer, it's now gone under the Aztec beam. There were some 60 impotent seconds while we were running in the blind, or more literally, death. Time to fire yet? I asked impatiently. Quickly, rather ir irritably. No, sir. Wait. Then, kid, stand by. Fire. I went to the back of the bridge to watch the depth, cars, depth charge crews working some beefy manual work to get the double pattern off. There were some pauses of seconds between the charges sank and the depths to explode. Then again came the deep rumbling thunderous crumps. The mounds of water were forced up from below, not the vast columns of water from the charges set to explode shallow but powerful, aerated tumuli bursting through the surface. Contact regained 1,000 yards from the Aztecs. Bugger! We've not sunk it. We'll have to do it again. I've reduced speed. From Kid, suddenly, confidently, almost calm, U-boat surfacing. We can hear her blowing tanks. 
quite clear. Keep all guns on the Aztec beam. Get the boarding party into the whaler, which is like a, a small boat they have on board. We want some of the German signal books, even if we can't capture the U-boat. A chorus of reports and cheers from the lookouts and gun crews surfacing green four five. The black looking bow appeared at a steep angle and the U-boat levelled off, doing some two knots. Open fire, I said. Hoist flag five, the signal meaning open fire at once. Half ahead, both engines, starboard 20. I'm going to get close. From the coxswain, you're crossing her to torpedo tube, sir. Thank you, coxswain. It'll be all right. Then B gun. Why don't you open fire? Loaded star shells, sir. Pull the bloody trigger at once. A hit on the conning tower and a shower of spectacular sparks. Very close now, then cease fire. We did not want to sink the U-boat. To the first lieutenant, get the boarding party uh, boarding. To the first lieutenant, get the boarding party boat away. Frost. They're manning their guns. Remember the U-boats had a uh, relatively large cannon, uh, caliber cannon on it. It was a brave act with the destroyer so close. Kid. Take the old bridge Lewis gun and keep them far away from their guns. It's point blank range, sir. Do it at once. Spray the U-boat's casing. The red tracer bullets from the Lewis gun were too much for them. The German crew jumped overboard. Frost. U-boat sinking. They've opened seacocks, sinking fast. Bloody hell. Couldn't we have been a bit quicker? No, we could not. The Germans have beaten us to it. Our whaler, now in the water, could only help the corvette boat to pick up German survivors while we lowered scrambling nets down both sides of the ship to help the survivors swimming to get on board. It was over. It was a pity to be seen off at the last moment and get no capture of the U-boat, not even any German signal books. As a mild consolation, Wanderer had been able to hoist the famous Flag 5, meaning open fire at once. I, for one, was mildly relaxed watching the survivors being recovered when suddenly Torpedo approaching bearing 185 degrees came from the report from the Aztec cabinet. There must have been a second U-boat. Could we get two in one day? Full ahead, port engine, hard to starboard, I ordered. Coxman, the coxswain re repeated the order back, then port engine going full ahead. Wheels hard, starboard, sir. From me, midships, half ahead together, steer at 185 degrees. We were now aimed at the source of the supposed torpedo, but the report had come from the action team who were taking a breather. So they would have headed towards the torpedo to kind of shield their... Um, uh, it was probably going to be a gnat if it was a first attack, so they were trying to shield their propeller. In a flash, Kidd and Cox were back on the job, and they were at once pronounced disappointingly that it was a false alarm. Here is an example of how we had so often to rely on the judgment of a young and junior rating in a remarkable respon remarkably responsible position at taken over from the full-time Aztec team. Recriminations for causing a false alarm were plainly not on. If such a young rating was not up to the job, he had to be replaced. Due to the diversion, we had only picked up 13 Germans and regrettably, I almost certainly drowned one or two of them that were swimming around the wondrous screws when the ship had to be turned so violently towards the supposed torpedo. However, the Corvette picked up 20 or so, including the U-boat CO. I think that's as far as I wanted to go. So I just wanted to show, uh, although this took several hours, uh, how exciting it is and the technology involved and the teamwork and the hundreds, hundred and nearly 200 people on a LRE uh, working together uh, to get this U-boat sunk and rescue its crew. So that's all I want to show. So I've briefly shown uh, the book. It's an old, old book, but it's cool. It's short, easy to get into, and well written. And um, I'm going and reading about the Sharn Horse at the moment, which is interesting. Let me know if you want to hear more stories or if you think it's a load of tosh. And I should do whatever you guys think I should do. I hope you enjoyed it. Otherwise, and see you later.